drive to register black voters. The Beatles started filming the movie Help. In February of 1965, Martin Luther King was arrested with 700 people in Selma. Peter Jennings became the anchor of ABC Nightly News at age 26, which is interesting because we always just thought Walter Cronkite was yeah. the voice of every news item. Yeah. Um, Motown and the Supremes were in full swing. Yeah. Um, in March, eight days a week hit number one. Yeah. Uh, also in March, Martin Luther King marched from Selma to Montgomery. So civil rights was really, 65 was big. Um, the Vietnam War was really starting to escalate. Um, in May of 65, the Rolling Stones recorded Satisfaction. Ticket to Ride went to number one. Uh, in June, birth control became legal for married couples. Uh, in June of 1965, Bob Dylan recorded Like a Rolling Stone. In July of 1965, the Jefferson Airplane formed. Um, in July of 1965, Bob Dylan released Like a Rolling Stone. <laughs> Pretty remarkable. Um, LBJ sent an additional 50,000 troops to Vietnam, bringing the total to 125,000 soldiers. Uh, in August, the movie Help opened. Um, also in August, the Beatles played Shea Stadium. Um, in August of 1965, Bob Dylan was booed for playing electric in Forest Hills, New York. Do you think anybody booed the Russian friends when they played electric in Forest Hills, New York a couple months ago? Um, in September, Lost in Space, Get Smart, and I Dream of Jeannie all from here. In November, Muhammad Ali knocked out Floyd Patterson for the heavyweight championship. And in the end of 65, 25,000 people demonstrated against the Vietnam War in Washington, D.C. So 1965 was a pretty heavy year in a lot of ways, and it was really the beginning of a pretty major cultural zeitgeist that was happening, certainly in San Cultural Francisco. earthquake. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was changing the world. And, um, and the Grateful Dead were right there at ground zero with all of that. But Actually, we're while, all that was, while all that was going on, we were, we were in a rehearsal room playing. <laughs> Yeah. We noticed all of that, except for the records. Whoa, Bob Dylan. So, so leading up to leading up to 1965, we're gonna have Phil talk about a couple of things that happened. You know, he met Jerry Garcia. I believe it was in '59, or first saw Jerry Garcia. Um, Ken Kesey and Phil became friends. And no, 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 we were never no, friends. No, they weren't friends. They were, they were, Phil told me that Kesey was used to kick him out of the house next door that Vic LaBelle lived in on Perry Lane, which is a very famous street where these writers live. But there was a lot of stuff going on. There was um, St. Michael's Alley, which was a little coffee shop. And so Phil was a college student in the College of San Mateo, and this, there was a scene going on in Palo Alto, and that's how Phil gravitated to there. So we're going to talk a little bit about, or Phil's going to talk a little bit about how he met Jerry, started seeing some of this music, and leading up to Magoo's Pizza Parlor in 1965. So Phil, take it away from kind of a condensed version of 61, 62, 63. 64, Phil had long hair and worked for the United States Post Office. <laughs> Until they fired him. They made him cut his hair twice, but it was not short enough for them. So Phil, tell us a little bit about 61, 62, kind of leading up to that. Well, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm 18 years old and I'm at uh, College of San Mateo in 1958. I, I, I went there for a, uh, because they had a great uh, big band uh, uh, arranging program uh, there where they had a, had a really good band and a, and a guy who could teach you how to write for it. And so I, I, went, uh, I went up down there and looking for that. And of course, as you always find what you're not looking for, but what you needed. So I got, I got, I, I immediately got set, like swept into this whole current of, of people who weren't, you know, necessarily musicians, you know, but they were really cool people and they were involved in the arts and, and, uh, and engaged with them. And uh, uh, the, there was nothing happened. There was no scene around the College of San Mateo. It was, it was at a place called Coyote Point where they. The plane, uh, the jets going, coming into the airport would fly right over Coyote Point like 300 times a day. 
So, the, I mean, the, the, and it was San Mateo. There was not a lot happening in San Mateo. <laughs> but around Stanford, just like in Berkeley, there's a huge scene of all the different kinds of people and thinking and, and uh, disciplines and interests. And it's all just roiling around these big universities. And, and there's, so there's a scene in Palo Alto. So one of the people I was hanging with at this college lived in Palo Alto and he knew all about it. So he took me down to St. Michael's Alley. And this is like 59 or 60. And you now it's got to be 50 something. So, and we just started hanging out down there. And there wasn't anything particularly going on that night, but it was clear that, that, that you know, people would come through and occasionally somebody would pick up a guitar and play some music. It was all folk music. I, I was, uh, I was into, deeply into, uh, how shall I say, hyper-complicated classical music and jazz. And folk music was a stretch for me at first. <laughs> but but it, 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 started, it started working on me. And I, I, I really liked the way it, it told a story. And Anyway, I, I, I started enjoying listening to it, and, and, and uh, the, uh, the people that came through all kind of gravitated around some, some, the several places. There was a, a place in East Palo Alto, uh, and there was this place called the Chateau, and, and this and it was like a kind of a circuit. You know, with, uh, from one weekend to the next, the, the action would move between these places. And uh, so I started hanging out in that on weekend, in that scene on weekends. And, I actually met Jerry at the Chateau in uh, 1959. It's a place up in Menlo Park, a great big house and owned by a guy who, I don't know, I think he was in the laundry business or something. <laughs> and he was he lived all by himself and he said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm just going to rent these, these rooms out to anybody. And he had his apartment downstairs and, you know, we had the rest of it. <laughs> so that's something that, that there, were, there were constantly parties there. And the first party I went to, there. It was, it was such a great experience because it was like it was one of those parties that spills out onto the grounds of the house, and there was yeah, yeah. enough grounds around it, even though it was an urban uh, situation. In the, in the media, you guys were called beats at that point. Did oh, you no, guys? No, no, we were never called beats because we were never beats. The, the older guys, not even Kesey was a beat. You know, so the, the guys that were older than him. So it was the folk scene. So then let's let's fast forward just a little bit to like 62, 63, where and when LSD came into the picture. No. <laughs> Can we talk about that? Yes. It is okay. Well, uh, yeah, it was legal. Yeah. I mean, just I just started hearing about this this substance and. It came out. Uh, there's a couple of books that were I influential. Uh, Doors to Perception. Um, I think that's Huxley and uh, uh, Alan Watts. Our uh, Juris Cosmology. And uh, they, these were books that were current in our circle, and they were describing these experiences that we were having. Uh, Huxley was mostly about mescaline, but uh, Watts, I believe, mean, he was he had experienced the LSD. And uh, he wrote very eloquently about it. And how it was more a form of prayer, really, than anything else. It was, a, it was like a, a spiritual awakening or opening. And, uh, and, and, and it, I want to say, at no time did we ever get the sense or have the sense that it was a party drug. So, uh, you know, it, it's just, it just creeps into the culture. It's a meme. And long before anybody sees any of gets a chance to try it. So it, it, it just sort of made its way in it. And uh, of course the CIA and the government were experimenting on Hunter and Kesey down here. Unbeknownst <laughs> to us. And, uh, so that, that, that was the really important connection. So, uh, so, so, you moved, so you moved to San Francisco. Yeah. And you were living in the Castro, and you were living out by the ocean. And you yeah, were still, still keeping in touch with all those guys. But there. on weekends, going back down to seeing what's going on, because that was still a scene in Palo Alto. There really wasn't a scene in the hate quite yet, um, at least not when well, it Well, it started to be in 64. 
and, and but it was in, in Haiti was not so much um, like party and music. It was just a sense of oneness of, of, of being in a place with people that were just like you, even though they didn't like minded individuals. Like minded individuals. Right. It's truly sweet. It's truly sweet. So, so you're working at the post office, and they make you cut your hair, and then you quit, and then you go down to Palo Alto, you knew Jerry, you had seen them playing, and you go to Magoo's Pizza Parlor, and the Grateful De uh, the Warlocks are playing some music and kind of blowing your mind, and during a set break, Jerry comes over and sits down in your booth and says, hey, we want to get rid of this guy on bass, Dave Morgan Jr., do you want to play bass? And you Please say, <laughs> protect me, uh, protect me. So, uh, so Jerry tells you that he wants he, he offers you the gig, and you're you're taken back, and your mind is blown. And, and what do you say? <laughs> I say yeah. <laughs> and, and Garcia offered you a, a guitar lesson, correct? No, no, I made him give me a guitar. <laughs> That was my one condition. <laughs> so he gave me a guitar lesson, and I went and practiced on the bottom four strings of the guitar, which, it, you know, it gave me a, a sense of the, the fingering mechanics and stuff. But it was so totally different when I actually picked up a bass, you know. But hey, it worked out. You think? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in 1965, I believe there were 12 official gigs by the Warlocks slash Grateful Dead. Um, most of them that year, I believe all the Magoo's, I don't think you ever played at any of the Magoo's ones. Your first one was at Frenchies, is that correct? Frenchies. Yeah. And uh, let's see, some of the other some of the other spectacular venues um, that these guys played at in 1965 were Frenchies, the Fireside Club, the Cinnamon A Go Go, the In Room, uh, Pierre's, which was in San Francisco, and that might have been your first San Francisco gig, and then and then there was a big one. That was, was a strip joint. <laughs> classy, classy, the Warlocks were classy, um, and there's there's some debate as to which show was the first one as the Grateful Dead, whether it was Pierre's or if it was one of the San Jose Acid Tests, or uh, it was um, the uh, Meme True Benefit number two, or it was the. Uh, the Mind True Benefit, of course, which was on December 10th. So well, here we are at the very end of 1965, and I believe that they're not even on the poster, so they were confused if their name was the Warlocks or the Grateful Dead. But, no, we uh, weren't. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were not confused. Bill Graham was a Bill was confused. <laughs> so Bill, Bill put them on the poster. Um, and they, they finished out the year with another acid test at Muir Beach, which was pretty famous, and uh, December 18th, 1965. And um, do you have any recollection? So, so here we are in 1965. If you can just spend a little bit of time talking about what it was like for you as Phil Lesh in 1965, joining the Warlocks, turning into the Grateful Dead, and all this other stuff, Bob Dylan and Vietnam, and, and, and all the stuff that was going on. If you just talk a little bit about 65, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the songs, and then we'll play music. My whole mind was just <laughs> uh, All of a sudden, I'm in the middle of the world, yeah, acting in it. You know, it, was, it was the most exciting time of my life. What was it like the first time you heard Bob Dylan on the AM radio? I was really, I really loved the sound of the instruments and the groove of it. And it just, it just come out of that little, the same tiny speaker. And I got in my post office truck. <laughs> or a transistor radio. High fidelity. Yeah. But it, it, I mean, it came out. It was, I, could, I could hear it all. It was really, it was, it was really exciting to hear that. And then right after that, I heard, I heard, I heard that Jerry had uh, formed an electric blues band with Pink Pan. And then you started going down to Palo Alto, you saw yeah. that. And before you know it, you're in that blues band with Jerry Garcia and Pink Pan. So they told you in the band, you sort of figured out how to play a bass. Um, and then you guys went and rehearsed one day for six, seven, eight hours, and you played I Know Your Rider for the whole day. <laughs> um, really still a favorite of all of ours. Um, some of the other songs you played in 1965, Early Morning Rain by Gordon Lightfoot. Yep. Um, I Know Your Rider, um, Mindbender, also known as Confusion's Prince, written by Garcia and Lesh. 
Um, the Only Time Is Now, which I don't even know that one. Caution. Um, I guess the, there's, a lot, there's a lot of different stories about how Caution came about. One chord, play it fast, and the train, and Jerry almost getting hit by those. Do you want to talk a little bit about Caution? Because that was really one of the yeah. first big mega crazy songs. Yeah, it's, um, it's quite a story, really. Uh, it, it stretches out over, over time, of course. But uh, we're on the train. I, I think we're going to Vancouver. Could have been. And uh, we're in the vestibule between the cars. And the, the train is going to hum. And it's a monster crew. It's just driving to go forward. And it, yet it's not speeding up. So we're looking at each other and saying, God, we got to play this. we got to play this. <laughs> Side of the, the group, you know, we're, we're opening. All of a sudden, he just sort of like leans over and starts to fall outward. Bob, like a snake, goes, <laughs> just then, another train goes by at about nine million miles an hour. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, 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 uh, that was a like, close one. <laughs> Today, the sound of that train going by in the other direction, and it's exactly the sound of Jerry going. <laughs> in caution. That was his signature lick in caution. Well, I mean, yeah, maybe you had to be there. But... <laughs> it's very significant to me. All right, any other final thoughts on 1965 and joining the Warlocks? And like I said, it was the best time of my life. Yeah. All right, so tonight, 1965, and then uh, we will continue moving on here at Jumping Crossroads throughout the years. Uh, stay tuned for an amazing set of music.